to support my channel as well as being part of my Patreon, you can obviously buy some gamer subs and save yourself 10% with my code T H O R A N for in at gamersups.gg. They've got lovely flavors. You know, I often used to say citrus lemonade was one of my favorite flavors. They've got their own like sort of rework that's just called lemonade. They've got tea. They've got this one with L theanine, which helps you go to sleep. No caffeine in it. Take that at night, help you doors off a lot easier in case you have problems sleeping. Thanks primarily to the release of the Denny Villeneuve versions of Dune. There is obviously a renewed sort of a renaissance of interest in the Dune series. People will know who follow this channel. I'm actually a massive admirer of the books. It's my favourite ever fantasy series and book in general would actually be God Emperor of Dune, the fourth book. And so obviously people are raving about the Denny Villeneuve film, films. I have to say, I do not actually think they're as good as people think they are. Don't worry, I will have some content coming on that soon. Because I notice it's especially those with very little or no experience of Dune who are giving the strongest reviews because essentially they just haven't experienced Dune itself and so Dune itself is able to bust through even the limitations or I would say sometimes cynical downplaying of certain elements of the story within the film by Denis Villeneuve. There's, there's enough is able to get through the cracks aren't able to stop the light shining through as it were and so people are getting the vibe that Dune's kind of cool, right? Obviously, then you have the people who have the contrarian angle that sort of like, essentially, you flip to, well, I always preferred the 1984 David Lynch one, even if it was a flawed film, you know, it's, it's like a flawed gem or a diamond in the rough and it was maybe too long in the studio th considerations and could you even film it? as if All that jazz, that's the angle. So mainly you get those takes. You either get like... I love the new Dune because I'm new to Dune or I prefer the old one because I like the aesthetics. It showed certain things from the book and obviously you got to see like David Lynch aspects. Obviously they copied like Geiger elements for the graphics, etc. in that one. But, and then also I'd say there's probably like what a small group of people who just go, I like or hate Dune based on modern day woke or anti-woke stuff, like what they're doing with this casting. Like, there's that part too. But what's bizarre is I feel like as always, I'm just on my own with my take. And it's like, there's no one else have this take. Oh, well, I'll put it out in the world then. Because I am going to do a, f a video that will be about all adaptations of Dune on TV and in film and I'll contrast them, etc. But I wanted to make this separate video to introduce people to, as the title says, what now would be the other other Dune. So not the Villeneuve Dune, not the David Lynch Dune. This is actually a TV Dune, but closer to a film than a normal TV show. So what happened was, in the early 2000s, it was actually in the year 2000, the Sci-Fi Channel, the American TV channel with Sci-Fi shows on, made Dune it's a three-part miniseries. And then three years later, they made Children of Dune, which even though it's called Children of Dune, the first part of it basically is Dune Messiah, what actually Denny Villeneuve supposedly will tackle next on screen and was never shown in the Lynch part, never even went into. So I had Dune Messiah, and then it was even so ambitious that the rest of it was Children of Dune, the third book of Dune, which if you know the storyline, the plot, and by the way, there will be tons of spoilers in this, but not like absurdly. So it's just that I'm not going to stop referencing certain things about later characters or things that happen in Children of Dune. So if you've never seen Dune, you're going to be in trouble. So I would say, by the way, just go watch June 2000 or all these, both these things now. Avoid the spoilers, but we'll get into it. So you then have this very bold aspect where they then do the sequels of Dune. They're both three parts each. So three parts for, for Dune, three parts for Children of Dune because it contains Dune Messiah within it. And I think they're each roughly about an hour and a half. So we're talking about, between the two of them, about nine hours of Dune. Like, this is awesome. Like, that gives tons and tons of room to explore whatever you want and give loads of background info and establish characters and build up dialogue between them and do subtle elements of intrigue and stuff. So as a result, I, I actually think people are going to massively underrate these films. And the fact that that people haven't heard about them despite this insane for all. It's so bizarre to me. By the way, Children of Dune itself is even, I think, on Amazon Prime, at least it is in my region. So you can even just go check it out there. Dune itself is the better one. Like, I actually think this ver this 2000 miniseries, three-part miniseries of Dune, is the best adaptation of Dune to ever be put on film. Then... Children of Dune isn't as good, or rather, more importantly, the problem is Dune is really solid and doesn't really have many lulls in it, even though it's like four and a half hours long or something. Children of Dune, the problem it has is the least interesting of the three parts or over this whole two-part cycle the, of the six parts, essentially part four, so the first part of Children of Dune, which is Dune Messiah, is the least interesting part. That's actually the part that has them, it's a bit more wonky or it's a little bit not as good, but it actually then gets re going and gets really good in Children of Dune too, especially because the area that the Children of Dune 
second miniseries has an advantage is none of that stuff's ever been put on film before. So actually just being able to get to see the film, I already know the story anyway, but being able to get to experience the story is very novel. And especially later, once it really gets going and gets cooking, has a chance to get going, it is pretty good. The end of it is really strong, put it out way. That's the other thing. It has a very epic feel. And in fact, I actually say, whereas Dune itself, the miniseries, is really good, Obviously, because of the scale of the story, it isn't as epic as the highs that you hit, especially in that third part of Children of Dune, with Leto the Second's plots, he already given spoilers, and things like what, how they resolve the Arlia plot, and then obviously all the stuff of like what happens with um, the Preacher and all that. That, that. that stuff is really ambitious and bold to even attempt. And quite frankly, I think they handle it pretty well. So I will say... The reason why it doesn't matter if Children of Dune isn't overall as good is it is still good. It's still worth watching. Secondly, it has never been put on film anyway, and then on the screen rather. And then thirdly, if you watch the first one, you enjoy it. You're surely going to watch the second series. Like I say, you are, right? It just makes sense. Now, I'll say right out the gate, the major downside of this series, but it's not that big a downside to me. It's just the most obvious flaw. It's because it's made in the early 2000s. You can imagine the computer graphics aren't insane. They're just all right. They're more like something out of a video game, quite frankly. But that's fine. Like, there's still enough there. It's not like you're working with puppets or something. And by the way, if you do puppets great, as the 80s showed, and people like Terry Gilliam and also the horror movie, you can do amazing work with prosthetics and puppets and real-life physical effects. So I, this is more computer-generated, so it does look a bit wonky because it's early computer-generated. But it's not an issue because any film, in my opinion, that is engaging and compelling enough doesn't need insane effects. You will buy into it. The suspension of disbelief kicks in, and you just appreciate what they're able to show you, and then you get into the rest of the story. And in Dune, while there are big action sequences, they're not like the most dominating part. I would say actually dialogue and intrigue and, and the way the story archetypally plays out with sort of mystical uh, dimensions is the most compelling and interesting part of Dune. So even some of the parts, which might not look insane now, but even so actually don't look that bad for when it's made. The cool thing about this is they do actually attempt to be ballsy and not hide the fact that they're going to show computer graphics. They go for it really with a lot of things like the Thopter scenes and stuff. And I actually say one that I actually think is a pretty good one too, which is an example of why I like this miniseries on TV as opposed to the films is. It's able to have time to let the plot breathe and show you details that they would just skip in the film. Like for example, there's a scene early on where they're introducing the guild navigators and you can see obviously they've done, made them look a little bit like the Lynch ones. And basically they have this discussion where they say essentially like, oh, can I watch or something? And then someone's like, oh, you know, that's forbidden. And then, you know, no human can watch that happen because obviously no, they don't, the navigators in the guild don't want you to know what happened to those potentially human people who became the navigators and what they look like and all this. So what happens is, and as soon as you realise this, you should see this is what this series is going to be like. I'm, I'm in. Is they leave the room and you get to stay and obviously you're not really in the universe of Doom. You're an observer, a, a, a voyeur anyway. And you essentially get to see what you're not supposed to. You get to see what happens when a guild navigator does that and how he links one point in space to another and folds space and time. And comes. You actually get to see that. They show you stuff like that. And the space scenes in general, like I say, if you play video games, you'll be fine with it. It's like just playing an old game. It's not the end of the world that's not like insane graphics. And if you watch the Villeneuve one, quite frankly, while well, the second one's better, I actually think in the first one, some of those graphics are too good. It almost immediately gives you an uncanny feeling of like, well, that's, not, that's obviously not real. It's obviously a computer graphic, isn't it? Because it's like, it's actually too good and the sheen is too good and the lighting's a bit too sus in the way that computer graphics things often are. So I would actually say that... On the contrary, if you actually find that the graphics are a big bother to you, you're probably just not vibe with the series, mate. You're probably not interested in the story. There's probably other things that you just can't get into, and that's just the straw that broke the camel's back, as it were. Now, one aspect that's mildly annoying is you can understand to do the effect to make the eyes really blue from the spice for the Fremen. You have, that's a computer graphic, and it's obviously a massive arse on for how many hours it is. So I will say it's a bit, it's a little bit weird the way that sort of like as they turn their head, or sometimes it'll start like that, and then they'll have a whole scene where it's not really on. They do seem like they're a bit inconsistent with that, but I understand it must have been a massive arse on to do. And in general, the effect is good when they do it originally. Obviously, they do it better in the modern films because we're able to make the effect look a lot cooler. Now, I will say, some people I've seen have commented that they think the acting has almost a vibe of more of a play or something, maybe because it's smaller sets and stuff. I don't really get that so much. Like, I know what they mean by that. Like, it has a, an aspect to it. It's a little bit more Shakespearean in that sense. Not in the language or anything, but in the way people are behaving. But I actually still think it's... The, I think the issue people are having here is, if you compare this to a film... 
yeah, it's more like a TV vibe. There's a bit of that. But if you compare it to TV, it's more of a film. So somewhere between the two, that's why it's a mini series, in my opinion, just a series of films, sort of. And quite frankly, where it actually is able to achieve what only film normally does and TV often struggles with is when it becomes very epic and the scale gets huge. So I actually think, by the way, the acting is one of the best parts of this film. There's another reason I'm amazed people don't know about this film. Because you're going to think, wait a minute, Early 2000s, sci-fi channel. Oh, is this going to be like some hacks and a bunch of bums? That's the most insane part of all of this, is the cast is mega, and you're going to know loads of these people. Like, the acting is really, really good. I think the acting is the best of any adaptation of Dune, even though the others also have some very good actors, cast at least. So the person who plays Paul Atreides more deep is Alec Newman. You probably might not know him that much. He wasn't in too many massive films after that. I actually think it looked from this film like he was going to be amazing. If people know the vibe that when you first saw the movie Blade, one of your takeaways was like, this Stephen Dorff guy is going to take over Hollywood. And that didn't really happen, did it? It's the same thing with the Alec Newman guy. I watched this, especially by the time you get to the end of Children of Dune, you're like, mate, this guy's killed it. This is like Lawrence of Arabia. Like, look, how, look how epic the scale is and where he's taken the character and how much they developed it. But bizarrely, it didn't go much beyond that. I think he does a great job in this. He's excellent as the young Paul. Does a really good job having that like naivety, but a little bit of the hubris of youth and not being sure what's going on and not sure if you uh, finish being a boy and becoming a man. Then he has Paul as prime, especially in the Messiah time period, where you see him at his peak and with all his Kwisatz Haderach powers, and then he's trying to manage like politics, and then culture and religion, and like the fate of humanity. Then you have later on when he's the preacher, and he's just totally different, this anti-hero figure almost, who's speaking against these things, and is sort of like undoing and unraveling the story of Mordeeb himself, right? Uh, this guy kills it in this role. He's really, really good. Like, you'll see, especially at the end of Children of Dune, this guy did work in this series. Then, he's obviously not that famous, but how about Duke Leto in the first Dune is William Hurt, like real actual Hollywood actor who's very legit. Uh, what's the complaint about? Hey, he does a great job. Maybe I'd say Oscar Isaacs was better in the other Dune, but hey, again, that's more for the comparison video, so we'll just leave that there. I would say the only, one of the few people I'm not as big a fan of is in the first one in Dune, still guys played by a guy called like Uwe Osinknecht or something like that. I wasn't as big a fan of him. He was all right, but I thought in Children of Dune when they recast Stephen Burkhoff, who would people might know this British actor who's got a booming voice and he's a sort of Shakespearean actor, he is very well cast as that role as still guy. He kills it in that one. And it, the sort of morality and the tone of Stilgar makes a lot more sense in that one, I think. Saskia Reeves in Dune as Lady Jessica, I think absolutely kills it. I think this is actually, here's the thing, again, I don't want to contrast too much, but I think this was a very good representation of Lady Jessica. This really captures the Lady Jessica from the book for me. She is motherly, but she is also concerned and she is daring, but she's afraid in her own way. She's, they capture a very, very well um, set up feminine character, considering how different the feminine character of Cheney is later, for example, who also very well cast. I will say, I do think in Children of Dune when they recast this character as Alice Krieg I didn't think she was as good and particularly I thought she wasn't as good at doing the motherly stuff and I especially like the Alia relationship didn't quite vibe the way I would have liked it I would have loved to see what Saskia Reeves could have done but more importantly I also think she's just not good looking enough Saskia Reeves is actually legit good looking for an older woman and especially at this point in time the Alice Krieg one doesn't ever ever hit that for me and while I understand acting's acting sometimes you do sort of need to fit the part as well James Mack who obviously at the times and nobody he's gone on to become huge now does a really good job as late on the second uh, look he's still young but you can already see this guy has talent as an actor i actually think ph moriarty as gurney is excellent i would say also gurney was very good in again i'm contrasting i guess but in the modern villeneuve one uh, julie cox is a ruling kills it best representation we've seen so far of her and she has time to actually have the intrigue and to be and the first one in the background and finding out who Paula Trades is and the Harkonnens. And then the second one, she's obviously playing more of a role in being a mother by Children of Dune to the twins. Again, spoilers. I actually think probably the most underrated one, and this is why I get the feeling people just haven't seen this miniseries, is people are loving Stellan Skarsgård as Baron Harkonnen, right? But he doesn't really actually get many lines or have that much actually that he sort of does in those films. This is the best representation of Baron Harkonnen you will ever see with Ian McNeese. It is a master stroke performance. This is Baron Harkonnen. He isn't just a psychopath. He isn't just evil. He isn't just, I want to kill people. He's a Shakespearean villain who plots and has Machiavellian schemes and can be charming if he wants to in the moment and can be an orator if he wants to be. It can be a degenerate in his own way, but that isn't too played up. It's made it actually so it's almost like a lovable 
Uh, foible of his character and essentially if you're some one of those guys who likes to watch films where they make the bad guy sort of compelling like a Magneto or the Joker or something you're going to fucking love this representation of Baron Harkonnen you'll be able to vibe with it especially by the way for Children of Dune because the way they're able the mechanism by which they bring back Baron Harkonnen and Children do you think what do you mean he died at the end of Dune yeah that's the point the way they do that just lets this actor Ian McNeese he already was going harm in, in Dune in Children of Dune, it is fucking baller. And all I'll say is this. The scene that's one of the last scenes that he has, where it shows him speaking through Alia to Jessica, it's fucking dope. And what a sick end to the arc of Baron Harkonnen that is, because it's a very cool way to bring him back and bring him in a totally different concept. And obviously, in theory, he's related to the Atreides, isn't he? But obviously, if you know that, you know that. I actually think in Children of Dune especially because it's where she does most of her work, that the Barbara Kodetova, who plays Chani, kills it. She, It's such a different performance from what's done in the Villeneuve ones. It's way better. It's much more like the book Chaney to me. Uh, Zazuna Geislerova, who is the person who plays the Reverend Mother, just does a good job. She kind of does what you'd expect. I don't know that it's as good as the other Dune ones, but I thought it was good. If it didn't, if there was no other one existed, you'd get the vibe of the character and what it's doing and what's going on with Abomination and the pain box and all that jazz. I wasn't as big a fan of the woman, Daniela Am Amavia, who plays Alia. I just thought she just was a bit generic. She was more like just some generic like sex symbol figure they just put into like Game of Thrones or something for titillation. I actually thought they needed a stronger actor at her job. And I also did think the other role that was actually quite underwhelming, was Matt Kiesler as Fade Ruther. I didn't think he actually did that very well. They make that almost too comical. That's the area where the film isn't quite as hard-hitting as it wants to be because they don't make that character interesting. Whereas, without going too much into the Villeneuve one, I actually think that character is the best part of both of the films that he's made so far. I actually thought it was one of his strongest parts and actually one of the rare areas where he goes into Lynch territory of showing something on screen in an interesting way about being ambitious with what he does with it. So yeah, thought there was that too. So the, the cast, I actually think, is excellent, particularly for Dune. But in Children of Dune, there's enough people and there's a couple who come in who actually are good in their own ways. Crucially, even though I don't need adaptations to be super faithful, this is a very faithful adaptation and in the best possible sense. It allows the stories and the characters of Dune to shine through and to blossom. It doesn't force you to think one thing or another, which is a problem I actually think the modern films are having. Like... They are trying to crowbar what you think about the Fremen Jihad or Paul and the Golden Path or whether it's right to be a Messiah and to lead it. They do quite clearly take modern polit political thinking and morality, whatever that is, consensus and morality, and impose it as a grid over the film and force you to choose. You must think this and you must like that guy and you must not like this person. You must. Do this film's much more like you. It just lays out a bunch of characters. It's kind of with you how far you go. Yes, obviously this one's somewhat a hero. This is somewhat a villain, but it's not. It's never, never quite entirely one or the other, though. It's not. It's just their birth sides of the same cut. It's not that. It's not that everything's morally grey, George R. R. Martin thing, but there's nuance, is the point. And, like I say with the Baron Harkonnen, you can get into it. You can vibe with it. You can like what the Talaxa were doing. There's all sorts of angles you can take on this one. Obviously, still got certain points at odds with people like more deep, right? The music, by the way, is surprise and shockingly good for TV. Like, this could actually be, I mean, the joke is, even if you could sort of, like, hear it without anyone telling you, you would think this is like the Gladiator soundtrack. It's really good and really fitting, especially for sort of the Fremen scenes and stuff. It's really awesome, and it's able to capture and rouse that epic feeling that you want to have in a giant space opera like Dune. So it means that when there are scenes where people's kids get killed or their loves die out or when a father meets a son and they have their final important conversation, they are so epic because of the music. And some of the montages, you will remember this music in those scenes for a long time. I think you'll get sad. You might even drop a tear. Like, it'll really get to you, and it really emotionally makes the film very resonant resonant so for me the key thing is they were able to show you so much more of the story the characters and the universe of dune like the preacher aspect in children of dune is really dope like if you've only ever seen dune or only read dune the book you're going to be like what the hell this is this is insane i'm super intrigued where this is going what are they trying to imply and, and what does this now change about what i thought about dune and the prophecy and that I also think, by the way, the fact that in Children of Dune, they start to explore the idea of the Golden Path, although it's nowhere near.
idea what it becomes in God Emperor. That's quite interesting in itself. That's an interesting way to shift the perspective because one of the interesting things is what they do with the whole sandworms and Arrakis and what's going to happen after Paul Adrede's thing, which they're able to handle in that book. I do think also the breathing room allows it, Game of Thrones or A Song of Ice and Fire style, to actually have intrigue and to have slow burning scenes and characters that are gradually introduced and built up and over time develop, not just like he's this person and then he switches or he's this person, he's only that person. Like you'll see when they have the scenes on Carino or when they were on Gady Prime or with the Tilaxu in Gold Children of Dune, these actually have much more of the feel that people want. When people say, I wish it was just made like Game of Thrones, that's just because the graphics would be better. They already did do it. That's what these films basically are. And then I also think like, the, like I say, the, the epic feeling of Children of Dune is really, really strong and for a lot of it, the scenes on all the home worlds are awesome. Gady Prime, etc. The dialogue is given a chance to breathe too, so you get the proper book dialogue. I doubt Hollywood, by the way, will ever get past you, Messiah. I believe Villeneuve already said, like, initially that he didn't want to go past you, Messiah, and now he's just saying he's going film by film. I don't think he'll go beyond you, Messiah, not least because of who he's cast, like especially who he's cast for Duncan Idaho, and then also because of the stupid angle he's taken now, like another film would essentially be the capper for his. So I don't think you'll ever see Children of Dune on, on the big screen, unfortunately, or on TV beyond this, and I think they'll never go to God Emperor or beyond that. So sadly, you'll never get some of the cool stuff in God Emperor or Chapter House, etc. But I tell you what, these two miniseries deliver. The first one is is really good. The second one, it takes a little while to get going, but then I think especially for what it's able to show, it's really ambitious. And so as a result, I give it a lot of marks in that sense. This is the Dune that you want to check out if you're a fan of Dune. And even if, like, if you like the modern films, like this is the other, other Dune. But for me, this is the real Dune. Obviously, my main gig is over in esports on my main channel, but my side channel and all my content around my other interests here are kindly supported by my Patreon community on Thorin's side here. So do you want to ask me a question for my video AMA? Do you want to take part in a private one-on-one -on -one exclusive, never to be released, but recorded for you session? Call it consulting. Call it just a conversation if you want. Do you want to find out who upcoming guests are for the Thor Inquiry episodes? If any or other other perks like this take your interest check out the patreon link in the description box below and join Thor inside today